Uh, first, Shalom, first and foremost, as always, I want to give all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Racha, Kodash. Double honors to the Apostle, Elders of Great Millstone, and peace and blessings to the hopeful elect. In this lesson, I want to go into hell because uh, certain individuals uh, coming from the churches and finding out that you're a Hebrew Israelite might, uh, might be confused on what uh, hell is might think that hell is, you know, a place where you burn forever. But according to the scriptures, when you come into the proper knowledge of the scriptures, you find out that hell is not a place where you burn forever. And, you know, certain people might be teaching that, you know, hell is a place where you burn forever. And that's incorrect. And in this lesson, I want to get into uh, how hell is a condition and a place and get into, you know, a little bit of the history of where that whole thing of hell came about. So let's just get into it. But our uh, first precept I'm going to bring out, this is uh, Titus 1 and 14. It says, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. And what you're going to find out is that this concept of hell where you burn forever, you know, people who are wicked, they burn there forever, is a fable and it's a commandment of men. Right. So first things first, let's get into, uh, let's get the definition of hell, right? Salakia, the phone's slow. I'm using my old phone, so Salakia, if it's going to be slow. So we have here on Etymology Online, this is hell, the noun, right? And what you're going to find out is hell has multiple definitions, but we have to find the one that goes correctly with what the scriptures are talking about. So when you have hell here, it says uh, hell, right? It's a noun. It says netherworld, abode of the dead, place of torment of the wicked after death, right? So that is what the churches preach about, right? Is that it's a, a nether realm or, you know, another dimension where if you're wicked and you lived a wicked life uh, and you didn't, uh, you know, seek out God, that's where you go and burn for eternity. But that's not correct according to the scriptures, right? That is a fable. That is a made up story. But when you go here, Right. It says used in the uh, used in the KJV up for the Old Testament Hebrew Sheol. Uh, but how you you say that properly in the Hebrew would be Sha'awal and New Testament Greek Hades Gehenna. It says used figure figure like it used figuratively for a state of misery, any bad experience. So. According to the scriptures, with proper understanding, hell is not a place where you go a different dimension or a nether realm where you go and burn for eternity. Hell, according to the scriptures, is the grave or it could mean a place of what? I'm sorry, not a place. Sorry. Now I got me saying it. Slip of the tongue, but not of the heart. A bad experience or state of misery. Like you might be having a bad day and your friend sees that you, they might say like, oh, you're going through hell today, man. I could see it on your face. Now, it doesn't mean that you're actually walking through hell. Now, again, there's no such place as hell, but it doesn't mean that you're walking through hell. But what? You're having a very bad day. Today is not your day, right? So hell can mean a state of misery or any bad experience. Now, let's prove that uh, with this uh, story that I found earlier. What was when I could find the article? Okay, cool. Now I'm going to read through a bit of this. All right. And then I'm going to get some precepts. So again, let's go back. Now we saw when we went uh, through the uh, hell definition on the etymology online, what? We saw two definitions. We saw, you know, the, the what the churches uh, preach about or they talk about, which is the nether realm place where people burn forever. And we saw that it could also mean what? a state of misery or any bad experience. Now we're going to get into where the story, you know, give some back history on where this whole concept of uh, what the churches preach about the hell, about where that whole burning forever comes from. 
and going to get afterwards some precepts backing up how it could either mean a state of misery or a bad experience. And it's not talking about, you know, um, Slakia. It's not talking about a place where you burn forever. That's not scriptural. That's not in the scriptures. All right. So let's get into this. It says the word hell is derived from Anglo-Saxon word hellia derived from Old English or Old Norse, Old High German hell or heli circa 725 A.D. That is used in King's James in the King James version of the Bible to capture the Jewish concept of Gehenna as the final destination of the wicked. The word occurs a number of times in different verses as the Valley of Hinnom, right? A garbage dump outside Jerusalem where children were sacrificed to the god Molech. And if you know anything about Molech, you would have to give sacrifices. And the thing about Molech as well is that uh, the um, the story behind it is where, like it just said, children would be sacrificed there. And that's how you can see where the concept of hell comes from. Because what? When they were sacrificing, when wicked Israelites were sacrificing their children to the god Molech, they would put the, uh, the children on on the f the fire thing and what the, the children would be screaming and things like that right and i think they also said that that's when the priests would hear the wicked priest obviously uh would he get revelations from hearing the screams so now you hear you get you're getting the concept of where this uh this whole story or this fable of hell came from obviously if you put a child on a burning you know statue or however they did it obviously it would start screaming and crying and that's where they get the whole concept of, oh, that's where you burn forever and you hear the screams and cries of people. It really goes back to, you know, wicked Israelites and also heathen, the other heathen nations were sacrificing unto this false god Molech. So continuing again, or I'll just re reread that. It says the word occurs a number of times in different verses as the Valley of Hinnom, which the Valley of Hinnom was a garbage dump outside Jerusalem where children were sacrificed to the god Molech, and the bodies of those who died in sin were thrown on, on the garbage fires. The valley was a curse, and certain sins such as adultery, idolatry, pride, mockery, hypocrisy, and anger led to the abode of the damned. But that, again, is a Jewish fable. And when you get into it, uh, it says, The valley was a curse, and certain sins such as adultery, idolatry, pride, mockery, hypocrisy, and anger led to the abode of the damned. And I believe, because uh, I remember playing that video game years ago. It was like a copy, God of War. It was called Dante's Inferno. And dealing with that whole thing with Dante's Inferno, there's a concept of the nine realms of hell. I think the first one is like limbo. The second one is like greed or hatred. Something, it's a bunch of foolishness. But the whole fable behind that is... You know, you have lust, you have uh, limbo, you have greed, you have uh, hatred, uh, wrath. I think it's something like that. You know, then uh, it's something about the nine circles of hell. Look it up yourself. But I remember, I remember from playing that video game. All right, and uh, getting into all that, you can see where again the concept for these different stories come from. You know, it just it just labeled like what seven things. Adultery, idolatry, pride, mockery, hypocrisy, anger. That's, yeah, that's about what, six right there. So you can see where, you know, these, these stories come from. So continue. It says, led to the abode of the damned. Gehenna originates from the ancient Greek and ancient Hebrew that takes the form of the Greek uh, Gina, which is found in the New Testament. A phonetic trans uh, transcription of Aramaic Gehenna. I'm going to guess you say that, uh, not uh, like how it's written there because they have the little lines at the top. But continuing, it says the concept is also found in the Old Testament and the Talmud, figuring as a place of punishment for the wicked after resurrection, which is not scriptural. There is no place where people go and burn forever. Again, going to prove that. Right? <clears throat> now this part goes into well we'll read that as, this as well because this adds to the fable it says by contrast hades in ancient greece is the god of the dead and king of the underworld often represented as the three-headed dog cerberus hades ruled the underworld where souls of the dead end up 
Poseidon ruled the sea and Zeus the sky. Tartarus, originally a place to imprison those who posed a threat to the rule of Olymp uh, to the rule of the Olympians, later became a place of punishment for those who had committed serious crimes. In contrast to Elysium, where the righteous came to rest. Again, you're seeing that concept of that those fables of heaven and hell. Again, is there a heaven? Yes, there is a spiritual uh, a spiritual realm. It's called the third heaven. Uh, Paul talks about it in the book of Corinthians when he got stoned. He talks about being taken up into the third heaven. He talks about, I knew a man in uh, Yahushai about 14 years, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, the Most High knoweth. Right. That's the third heaven. That's the spiritual. Realm. So, yeah, there, there is that, you know, heaven, but there is no hell where anybody else goes and burns for eternity. No, that is a fable. And you're seeing that same fable live here in Greek mythology. Where you have Elysium, where people go in the, the righteous go and they're good there. That's the heaven. And then Hades is where I'm guessing everybody else goes. But again, that's a fable. That's not according to scripture because you can't pull out a scripture and tell me that, OK, heaven is where all the good people go and hell is where people are going to burn for eternity. There's no scripture you can pull out that literally says that. That's just a contorting of words. And, you know, again, like we like I brought out earlier in uh, Titus commandments of men and things that turn from the truth. <laughs> Uh, continue, it says, Tartarus is a place beneath Hades, deep in the earth, far from the sun, engulfed in gloom and inhabited by monsters and giants. And people also believe, which I grew up believing that as well, that what? Hell is in the ground, you know, deep in the, it's deep in the ground in some other dimension down there. And you're seeing the similarities here with these uh, fables in Greek mythology, for one. Uh, punishments were administered for crimes that included those who hated their brothers and beat their fathers, defrauded their family, and accumulated wealth without sharing it. Many of these offenses interestingly involved issues of trust and loyalty. So I want to get to the juicy part. Here we go. It says the Christian concept and doctrine of hell is used some 23 times in the New Testament, although it is not in the Greek New Testament, which uses the Greek concept Tartarus or Hades. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. It says the Christian concept of hell we have inherited and fashion then is a theological combination of three ancient concepts derived from Greek and Hebrew mythology and theology, right? Mythology, which, you know, Lord's willing after this, we'll get uh, uh, either the definition of mythology or the etymology on that word. It says even even although they have different origins and meanings. The notion of hell predates Christianity by thousands of years by Egyptian and source, uh, by Egyptian and sources of Jewish, Jewish mysticism, such as the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah mentions seven different divisions of hell, including uh, Ginnam and Sheol, meaning Hades or underworld is the most common. And seven divisions of hell. I believe that's going into the whole the nine circles of hell thing that I was talking about earlier. It says the history and concept of hell has played a central theological role in Christian and religious and religions of Abrahamic persuasion. Religious life and education as the place of eternal damnation where evil souls are punished. It was a substantial. Listen closely. It was a substantial part of the furniture that housed the moral tradition and Christian mythology that educated the population and provided moral basis for law, justice, and order within institutions that comprised society. I'll read that one more time. It says it was the substantial part of the furniture that housed the moral tradition and Christian mythology that educated the population and provided the moral basis for law, justice and order within institutions that comprise society so this is how they were able to control the minds of the people by giving them a story that hey if you're wicked and you're evil you're going to go burning in hell for eternity and that's how you would control the minds of the people to prevent them from doing things they made up a story it's not real that hell is not scriptural says uh where was i 
Right. It says theory, theories of hell were depicted as nightmarish visions that embellished early scriptures, church decorations and paintings. In its Christianized form, it became a source and warrant of reinforcing the moral teaching. Right. So it became a source. Right. This is what they use to reinforce uh, of sake. It in its Christianized form, it became a source and warrant of reinforcing the moral teaching teaching of the church, later the monastery schools, and also a basis of medieval control of the children. So this is how they were able to control the minds of the people. And they use this made up story of hell where you burn forever that really goes back to the valley of of Hinnom. Uh or really goes back to Molech and all that, dealing with what the sacrificing of children. When they sacrifice the children, you'd hear the screams and things like that. And that's how the story kept going on throughout the centuries. But there is no scriptural, you can't find nowhere in scripture where it talks about the Lord casting sinners into a place uh, burning with fire forever and ever. That's not scriptural. You can't find that. It's a, it's a twist of words to, to, you know, manipulate the minds of people, to control people. But hell is not according to what the churches preach, that, you know, nether realm or underworld where you burn forever, that is not a scriptural nor is that biblical. Now, I did say, so, Lord's willing, I remember to put this in the uh, uh, description box. Now, I also want to get that uh, mythology... Uh, definition. Let's get etymology. So here you have mythology. Noun, right? Exposition of myths. The investigation and interpretation of myths, and we're going to get what myths is also. It says, legendary lore, a telling of mythic legends, a legend, story, tale from mythos, a myth, a word of unknown origin. So it's just a story. It's a, a folklore, you know, it's, it's a story, a tale. It's not actually scriptural. Right, it says... Myth, the noun, from French and directly from modern Latinus, Greek mythos, speech, thought, word, discourse, conversation, story, saga, tale, myth, anything delivered by word of mouth. So this is just a word of This doesn't come from scriptures. This didn't come from the inspiration of the Heavenly Father through His Son. This just came from men. Again, like it said in Titus, by the... Uh, let's read it again. Salakia for the phone. I'm using my other phone. It's very slow, so I apologize. This is Titus 1 and 14. Again, it says, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. These, as it says here, speech, thought, discourse, word, conversation, story, a saga, myth, or tale. This is what uh, commandments of men. These are stories that came from men. This is not scriptural. There's nothing in the scriptures, again, that explain a place where people, God is going to put people to burn forever. It's a, it's a contorting of the scriptures. It's, it's a made up story, a folklore, a tale. You know how some people believe in like, you know, like Loch Ness Monster and they say, oh, that's a folklore a tale. Well, it's the same thing. Now we're going to get some precepts. All right. So we understand that now we should understand that what hell is what it's it's either speaking about the grave. Right. Which we're going to get. I'll get precepts to explain that. Or it's talking about like we uh, like I, I brought out earlier in the hell uh, etymology. That means a, a state of misery or a bad experience. All right. <clears throat> so let's get uh, how hell can mean a bad experience. Let's get uh, the prophet uh, Jonah, right? So just to give a little 
a short summary of what happens in Jonah, the first chapter. Jonah, the prophet, the Lord commanded Jonah to go preach to Nineveh. Jonah says, no, I ain't going to do that. I'm a dip because I don't want to preach to Nineveh. So what he does is he goes on a ship and tries to dip up out of uh, doing his job to go preach to Nineveh. The Lord commands a, tem a boisterous and tempestuous storm in the sea that, you know, almost is about to destroy the ship. The men in the ship are, you know, trying to find out, you know, why is this happening and things like that. They see Jonah's down in the bottom of the ship sleeping calm like nothing's going on. They wake him up like, yo, go pray to your God. Like, what's going on here? They, you know, they investigate him. Like, why are you sleeping so sound? You know, who are you? What is thine occupation? All this, you know, investigating him, trying to find out what's going on. You know, why is he so calm in this situation? Eventually, he tells them that he's in Hebrew. He fears the Most High Yahweh. And he's, you know, he's an Israelite. Then they find that out. And then eventually, you know, Jonah tells them, look, the only way that this storm is going to stop is if you, you know, toss me into the sea. The men don't do it, but then eventually they find out that there's no other way. So eventually they toss him into the sea. And then now we're here at the second chapter that after, you know, Jonah is tossed into the sea. Uh, the Lord made a giant uh, fish uh, swallow Jonah. So here we are, uh, Jonah, uh, the book of Jonah, chapter two. It says, then Jonah prayed. Now, mind you, Jonah was in a fish's belly for three days and three nights. A bad situation, right? It says, Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. And I said, this is Jonah speaking, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So again, Jonah was in the fish's belly for three days and three nights. It stinks. It's dark. He's like, what the hell am I going through? And he's hoping that the Lord have mercy on him. And he's in a very bad predicament, a bad state, a, a state of misery, a bad experience. It's not a good thing to be in a fish's belly. He's probably think he's going to get digested in there. Again, it stinks and things like that. It's all icky in there. So he's in a bad predicament right now. And again, like I said, it's dark up in there as well. So he started praying to the Lord, hoping that the Lord would have mercy upon him. And what? He said, this is what Jonah said. I'll read verse 2 again. And I said, I cried by reason of mine affliction, my state of misery, my bad experience that I'm going through right now, unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell. Now, is Jonah actually in the belly of hell? No, but he's considering what? That this being in the fish's belly is, is like being in hell. It's... It's a bad experience right now to be in this fish's belly. Let me see if another translation would say. Okay, that does not tell because he's not in the land of the dead. Okay, these translations do not do it justice at all. Okay, no. We're going to stick with the KJV. KJV is on point. Again, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. Hell meaning what? Could either mean the grave or a bad experience. And what Jonah was going through, when you read it here, is a bad experience being swallowed up by a giant fish and being in its belly. So hell can mean what? A condition. Hell, Jonah was not, Jonah got swallowed up by a fish. Jonah did not get swallowed up by hell and now he's burning up in there. No, he got swallowed up by a fish. And it means what? Hell can mean a bad condition, a state of misery, like we saw earlier in the uh, hell etymology. Right. So this is how linking that up. Once we find out the proper definition of the word hell going into the etymology of it and we bring out precepts and we bring out like this story here with Jonah, we see that, OK, this links up. This is how this makes sense now going to the definition of the word hell and now using this precept with Jonah. OK a state of misery, a bad experience. Scripturally, now we bring the scriptures now to back that up. Okay, we can put this together now. This adds up. This makes sense now. If you try to put the this other dimension and bring in Jonah chapter 2, you can see that this doesn't connect. This doesn't make any sense because what did the first definition say? It said a, you know, the, the nether realm or, you know, the place of, of the damned where people burn. 
But Jonah's not in a burning place right now. He's in a fish's belly. So you see that those two don't connect. So that doesn't make any sense for what the scriptures are saying. But the other definition that said what a state of misery, a bad experience, that links up with this now. So this is how you can see that, okay, this is scriptural. This makes sense. This is what the scripture is talking about when it says hell, a bad experience. Right? And also that what hell can also mean a uh, the grave. And how you say hell in the Hebrew is Sha'awal. Now, obviously, you see it says the underworld, but no. It's not talking about the place where you burn forever according to the churches. No, that's incorrect. The scriptures never speak about that. But you see it says grave or pit. So hell can mean a bad experience as Jonah is going through right now. Or it can mean the grave or the pit. Now let's bring out precepts for that. And all you have to do is just put hell. And search up precepts. Not going to go through all of them. But this right here is dealing with our Messiah, right? Who the word eagerly calls Jesus Christ. This is a, a precept about him. This is Psalm 16 and, 16 and 10. I believe this is a Psalm of David, but David was in the spirit speaking about the Messiah. This is Psalm 16 and 10. It says, for thou will not leave my soul in hell again. Does it mean that the Messiah was going to go down to hell? No, because again, like I said, this psalm right here, 16 and 10, is written about the Messiah. Although, if I'm not mistaken, David was speaking about it. This is really a psalm about the Messiah. It says, for thou will not leave my soul in hell. Hell meaning what? The pit, the grave, because the Messiah went on the cross. He died and they put him in the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the tomb. Right? It says, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Corruption meaning that his body didn't decay. If I'm not mistaken, you know, pardon me. After the third day, he rose again from the dead, right? Because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, after the fourth day is when your body starts to decay. I believe that, if I'm not mistaken, that also happened with Lazarus. I believe it was more than four days when they had Lazarus' body wrapped up that his body was starting to decay. But the Lord still brought his body back, uh, you know, brought him back to life, you know. But that didn't happen with the Messiah. That didn't happen with Yahweh shot. After the uh, third day, uh, he resurrected. His body didn't see corruption. His body didn't start to decay. And that's what, uh, if I'm not mistaken again, David is speaking the Psalms. He's speaking in the spirit about the Messiah. He's speaking about the Lord, Yahweh Shai. That thou will not leave my soul in hell. Thou will not leave my soul, my soul in the pit, in the grave. Because again, he resurrected after the third day. Neither will thou, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Right, his body didn't, to, his body didn't decay. So that's what it means. Hell is not talking about again a place where you burn forever. We're not seeing that linking up here with the scriptures. If we were to match Psalm sixteen and ten with the first part where it said in the uh, hell etymology about a place burning, we see that this doesn't link up. But when we have understand that what the second one meaning what it could or when we use the blue letter here and it said what the grave or the pit. And I'm pretty sure it said a uh, grave or pit also in that etymology uh, definition. I probably just didn't go over it. Salakia. But when you see uh, it means uh, the grave or the pit, we see that that links up. Right. Because what the Messiah was not left in the pit. He was not left in the grave because he resurrected and his body did not see corruption. Now, the next psalm would be Psalm 18 and 5. It says, the sorrows of hell can pass me about. If we're actually going to think that this is actual hell, you're going to tell me that hell was compassing uh, King David around? No, it means that, again, he was in a bad predicament. Actually, I'll go to this one. Okay, this is a psalm of David, and David is just, you know, exalting the Lord within the first two verses. And then I'll start from verse 3. It says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy. Psalm 18 and 3. It says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of, uh, the sorrows of death compass me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. So David was in a bad predicament, a bad experience, a state of misery. 
he was surrounded by his enemies. And when he's saying the sorrows of death can pass me, meaning that, you know, I'm in a bad predicament. It's looking like I'm about to die. It looks like I'm about to go to the grave right now unless the Lord does something for me. So that's what it means by the sorrows of death compass me. He's saying it figuratively. He's not meaning that hell is actually compass him like he's in hell, according to the churches, that burning hell where you, uh, that place where you burn forever. No, David is in a bad predicament. He's in a rock, between a rock and a hard place, and he needs the Lord to save him out of this bad predicament, which the Lord did. Right? And if we continue, in my distress, I called upon the Lord, verse 6, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills were moved and were shaken. So then the Lord made his appearance and saved David out of his bad predicament. Again, we see that what scripturally hell is not talking about scripturally. When you look in the scriptures, there is nothing here talking about a place where you burn forever. And you can go through all the scriptures if you want. And I'm going to use one more precept to prove that there is no place where you go and burn forever. I'm going to use the book of Job chapter 3. Right. So in this chapter, within the first chapter, I'm sorry, not uh, within the first couple of verses or let me go give a little uh, backstory within the first of uh, Job chapter one. You will find out about Job. He's a man that fears the most high. He has great substance. He's a rich man. He has a wife. He has a, uh, a couple of many a uh, couple of kids. Job's doing good for himself. Right. But then later on, there's a bet between the Lord and Satan about if Job really fears the Most High and if he's really, you know, a man of the Lord, if he really is about it. So the Lord and the Heavenly Father and Satan make a bet and things like that. And the Heavenly Father sets Satan loose on Job to kill his kids, to break, to make things happen to where he loses his substance, he loses his, you know, his animals and things like that. And he basically, Job is went down from this very high position of a man that had a lot of things to now a man that had very little or little to nothing and it was all to try his integrity to prove his patience and things like that to try him to see if he was really about it to see if he was really true to the most high right and uh later later on job's friends comes and uh, tries to comfort him or you know come see him and things like that and now we're here in the third chapter and job is beginning to lament about how he wishes he died so that way he wouldn't have to experience this bad predicament that he's in right now because, you know, Job is seeking for answer. He's not understanding why is he going through this predicament because he was very loyal to the Lord. He did everything that he thought was right to do. And it's like, well, why did I lose my kids? Why did I lose everything? Why am I going through this hell right now, this bad predicament? All right. So within these first couple of verses, Job is basically saying why he didn't die from the womb. Uh, I believe. Uh, right. I'll read from I'll start from verse 11. So this is Job chapter 3, verse 11. It says, Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost, which is talking about his spirit, when I came out of the belly? Right? Because he didn't want to experience this pain that he's going through right now. Why did the knees prevent me? Or why did the breast that I should suck? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. Meaning that he should have, uh, if he had just died, he would have been quiet. Meaning that he would have, you know, went to the spiritual realm. I should have slept, meaning slept, meaning that he, uh, meaning died and went to the spiritual realm. Then I had been at rest. All right, so let me read that again because I was a little all over the place. So let me explain that again. Verse 13, Job 3 and 13. For now should I have lain still and been quiet, meaning that he should have died. I should have slept. Sleep is synonymous in the scriptures for meaning that. You, what do you do when you sleep? When you sleep, you're at rest. So Job is saying here that when you're in the body, because you have to go through, again, hell here on the earth sometimes, meaning that you have to sometimes go through bad experience like experiences or, you know, states of misery like Job is going through right now. You're not at rest here on the earth. But when you die, your spirit goes to the spiritual realm and up there you're at rest. So what do you do when you go on your bed and you uh, what do you do when you sleep? 
you're at rest, you're at peace because you're at comfort now because you ain't got to worry about your woman bothering you. You ain't got to worry about a job. All you got to worry about right now, hopefully, is getting eight hours, eight to ten hours of sleep. You know, your body is at rest. You get to relax and chill out. And that's what happens when your spirit goes, when, you spirit, when your spirit leaves your body and goes up into the spiritual realm, it is at rest. It doesn't have to deal with the bullshit here that you have to deal with on this planet. So that's what it means I should have slept. I should have died right then i had been at rest right because in the spiritual realm is where your spirit is at rest your spirit is not at rest especially in this kingdom in this place you can't rest here right so verse 14 it says with kings and counselors of the earth which built desolate places for themselves right or with princes that had gold or who filled their houses with silver so job is talking about wicked kings and wicked counselors right or as an un or like it, or as an hidden untimely birth, I had not been as infants which never saw light. It's talking about stillborns. There the wicked cease from trouble, troubling, and there the weary be at rest. So Job is saying what? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. Where is it that the wicked cease from troubling? Not in hell, but in the spiritual realm, the third heaven that Paul uh uh, got caught up into when he after he got stoned. Paul talked about again. Uh, he got he got caught up into the third heaven. He says, "I knew a man in your house shy, about fourteen years, whether in the body or out of the body, I I know not. The Most High knoweth." He's talking about himself after he got stoned. His spirit started going up in the spiritual realm. He started seeing the spiritual realm. Right. He was having like what you would call outer body experience, and. That's the same thing that Job is speaking about here. Job is speaking about what? When you go to the spiritual realm, because all spirits go back unto the Father, that what? Um, Job uh, is saying that the wicked and the righteous both go into the spiritual realm, into the third heaven, where the Heavenly Father is, and they're at rest there. There is no separation where only the good go up and the bad stay down. No, both, like it says... Verse 17, there the wicked cease from troubling because there is peace, there is rest in that third heaven, in that spiritual realm. And there the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice, hear not the voice of the oppressor. Uh, verse 19, the small and great are there and the servant is free, free from his master. Right. So here Job is explaining that what? Hell, I'm sorry, in the spiritual realm, the third heaven that Paul was talked about, that that is the place where both the wicked and the righteous go up there. Okay, there is no hell where somebody goes uh, and burns for eternity. You do, you, you, you're not, there is no underground where you burn for eternity and you pretty much belong to Satan. That's where you, you, you know, you go there and burn. No, all spirits belong unto the heavenly father. Uh, let me see if I can find that precept where it says uh, the spirit goes upward. I believe that's Ecclesiastes. Is it 12 or 3? Let me see. Here we go. This is one precept, but I know there's another one. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth. What is the dust? Your body. Your body was made up of the earth, right? So then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, speaking about your body, because your body decomposes, the worms eat it, and your body go, turns back into what? The earth. And the spirit, your spirit that's within you, your life force, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Did not God give even wicked his, the, the spirit that's in them? Yes. So the Heavenly Father controls all spirits. He's known as the Father of spirits. So again, going back to Job, there the uh the uh the wicked and the weary which is the righteous the wicked and the righteous uh this their spirit shall return unto the most high who gave it so they both go back to the heavenly father they don't go to a separate place the wicked don't go to a separate place and burn forever no everybody goes back to that third heaven everybody goes back to the heavenly father who gave them a spirit <laughs> The only thing that returns downward is your body, which is the, it just goes back to the earth. That's it. But your spirit does not go down into another dimension and burn. 
Uh, if I could find this next precept, I believe it might be Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. Uh, I'll probably end it off here. Let me see. Oh, here we go. But, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Might save that other precept maybe for another video. <clears throat> this is Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 20. It says, all go unto one place, and, and all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. What is it talking about when it says all go unto one place? Again, like we brought out, like I brought out in Ecclesiastes twelve and uh, Ecclesiastes chapter twelve verse seven, it says what the spirit goes unto the Most High who gave it, right? So that's the all that go unto one place. All spirits, the righteous and the wicked spirits, go back to that third heaven, to the heavenly Father. But your body, all of the dust, your body is what uh, goes back to earth. That's when they put your body in the grave, in the pit, which is uh, like the scriptures talk about hell. Right, because hell again, when you go into it, is shot a wall, which means either the pit or the grave. That is where your body goes, but your spirit goes back unto God who gave it unto the heavenly Father in that third heaven. It says again, verse twenty-one: Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward? Upward where? Unto that third heaven, just like Apostle Paul, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. So that is the understanding of hell. Just a short recap. We brought, uh, I brought out earlier the etymology of the word hell. It can either mean what? A state of misery or a bad time. I brought out the, uh, the book of Jonah to, experience, uh, to uh, line that up. I brought out the book of Jonah to line that up with what? Jonah was in a fish's belly for three days and three nights. He was in a bad experience, a bad, a state of misery. And that's why he was praying to the Lord. So hell can mean what? A condition, a bad condition that you're in. And, and when we looked and when I looked it up in the blue there, what it was the Hebrew word for um, hell was what it says Sheol, but it means in the proper Hebrew, it's Sha'awal, which is what the pit or the grave. And that's where your body, your earthly tabernacle, your well, maybe not say earthly tabernacle, but your earthly vessel, which is this flesh goes to the grave, the pit. They dig a pit for you and put your body there, but your spirit which is what the Heavenly Father gave you, goes back up to him, to the third heaven that Apostle Paul was talking about in Corinthians. That's it. There's no place where you burn forever. When you look in the scriptures and you do, you know, uh, uh, a thorough look through the scriptures, you don't see there's nothing here talking about hell. So that's all. I pray that this video was edifying. I pray that, uh, Lord's will, you understand the concept of hell, that it's a bad predicament, or it can mean the pit or the grave. There's no, scripturally or biblically, there's no place where you burn forever. That is a made up story, that is a fable, and that is a commandment of men that turn from the truth. Again, I want to give all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Racha, Kodash, double honor to the apostle and elders of the great millstone. I pray that you were edified. Shalom.